How many were here two weeks ago? Anybody? You're not sure? Where was I two weeks ago? You know? <laughs> Isaiah 58, anybody? Hello? Yeah? Of course, last week we had Denise here and I was in Hermanus having a little bit of revival with the, with the Heaven and Earth Church. And, and um, so we're going to continue um, because I believe Isaiah 58 is one of the now words from the Lord for 2024 and 2025 and 2026. I believe it's a word for the rest of our decade because of what's taking place, what's going to be happening. And just a little bit of recap. Let me just shuffle some things around here. Okay. Just a little bit of recap. Oh, losing all my toys. There you go. <laughs> okay. And the entire chapter, Isaiah 58, there's 14 verses, and they so accurately, you know, capture God in us in, in such a profound, precise, and impactful way. And in just six verses in that chapter, we have the word will. 22 times, you know, he will, you will, I will, it will. Not you can, you should, you might. I mean, it, it just, the, the, the language um, in this scripture, in this passage, you know, your light will break out like the dawn, your recovery will speedily spring forth, the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard, you will, you know, you'll, you'll call out, you'll ask, and he will answer you know, the, your light will rise in darkness. You know, your, your, um, your, your uh, gloom will be like the midday. Um, the Lord will continually guide you. Uh, you'll be a well-watered garden. I mean, you're going to rebuild. You're going to raise up. You're going to repair. You're going to restore. I mean, this, this, it's just the language is so emphatic. It's so specific, so precise, so authoritative. The, the certainty is profound. This, I mean, this goes way beyond wonderful prophetic promises. And a lot of our Christian life is, is lived leaning toward, you know, what's going to happen. And then every now and again something happens and it just gives us enough vuma, you know, to, to lean forward into the next one. And, and that's wonderful, but th it, this is so different. It really is. It's like the difference between healing is coming and I'm healed. Big difference, isn't it? It's like the difference between, you know, um, God is going to bring you into a season of prosperity and 50 million rand is now in your bank account. A little different. And that's Isaiah 58. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like, you know what's interesting? It's not like that's changed, like, wow, there's something in there that hasn't been in there before. But certain, there are certain timings and certain seasons. You know, when it just kind of lights up, it comes like when you, when you got born again, John 3, 16 came alive. You know, you could have read that a dozen times, but when you got born again, it was alive, it was living. It was now, it was precise, it was powerful. And this chapter is exactly that. And um, these are not just future promises, you know, that we are preparing for. But I mean, they are present day certainties that we are positioned in. Okay, And I'm not saying there's not preparation going on, but there's a positioning as well. Because of preparation that's going on, sometimes we don't realize you wake up and, wow, you're there. It's like when you die, <laughs> wow, okay, I made it. <laughs> you know, and it's just like suddenly and certainly. And it's exactly that. That's what's here. Why are you guys so, is it the jacket, the suit? Oh, yeah, you didn't, you noticed. You guys were all distracted. <laughs> go, wow. I mean, everybody, I walk in, they go, wow. You know, you know, I do have them. By the way, this is a very special suit. It was, I bought this suit to do, my best friend, uh, we'll get back to this. My, my best friend, Bob Perry, he did, my wedding, my daughter's wedding with me, and I did his daughter's wedding with him, but she got married on a beach, Malibu Beach, and so I had to buy a beach suit. This was the beach suit, you know, 
And then the second time I wore it was at, was at the um, Bronte and John's wedding. And last night I wore it to the 50th anniversary of, of uh, CFAN, their banquet. And then I just thought, you know, you deserved the glory. So I, I said, okay, so just, you know, I, you know, just take, okay, now let's get back to the, you know, it's getting a little warm in here. I, Ooh, that's better. I was already starting to sweat. <laughs> it's, it's pretty thin, actually. It's good for the beach. Okay, where were we? All right. I find it interesting that, that God put such a prolific word in what we call the fasting chapter. I mean, historically, that's when I would read this. I would typically go to this chapter when I'm you know, going to fast, pray with fasting. And, 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 and fasting is the denial of food and drink for the purpose of focusing on and partnering with God. So there is a denial, there's a saying no to something for the purpose of focusing on and partnering with God. So we do say no to something, but 99.999% of this, this kind of kingdom equation is not in our you know. It's... it's, it's it, it, it's in the yes, and you've got to realize something here that a lot of people don't get. We do say no to something, but when we turn, we actually lean into his yes. That's how incredible this is. You know, we, there's a no from us, and then there's a yes from him. So if you turn around with a yes, and his yes isn't there, what good is it? It's his yes. Think about that. 1 Corinthians 1.20, the promises of God are yes and amen in him. Yes, think about that. Wow. You know, we work so hard, you know, God, you know, no, it's his yes. So we say no. There is that, you know, that mustard seed faith, that, you know, that, that infantismal little piece of response, and then we turn, and it's his yes. And, I mean, that is the, 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 the magnitude of the difference is, is just how much of this is from his side for us. I mean, it's, it's like similar to, you know, you, you know, when you get in the Bible, you get in the word, you're very aware of what you're reading, but you don't realize how much is getting in you. What's getting in you is infinitely bigger than what you're getting in. You don't believe me. It's because you don't read your Bible. No, no, you're, really, you're reading these words. And, yet you, but it, and it's going inside of you, and it's going to work, and it's doing things, you know. And you know, when you're praying in space and time, God is doing infinitely more in that space and in that time. So we're doing, so, the, and I'm not in any way diminishing the significance of what we're doing, but I'm talking about it in comparison, percentage-wise, how much of this is because of God. How much of the equation is met by his goodness, by his grace, by his mercy? And then equally fascinating about this chapter and this incredible, profound, you know, you know in, in encounter with God, this profound provision that is so authoritative and so now, it, it starts with this stark rebuke of a religious spirit that is grounded in our works, our efforts, how wonderfully obedient and beautifully biblical <laughs> we all are. This can and this does happen to all of us. All of us have fallen into that trap. All of us is the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter two that was corrected says, man, you can do this well, and you've got that. You've got stuff down to a science, but you've left your first love. I shared that two weeks ago. For those of you that weren't here, he's not talking about you leaving your love for me. You're leaving my love for you. It's the first love is his love. He's first love. His love is the first love. We love because he first loved us. And it happens. And that's how this actually starts. Why? Because there's a lot of gravity to stuff. 
especially good stuff. A lot of pull, and it pulls on your faith. And one day you wake up and you got more faith in the good stuff than you do in him. It happens. We're all guilty. We've all done it. Why? Because we, we live in a transactional world. Most of our life is transactional. You give, you receive. You know what I'm saying? And, and, we, and that sneaks in and it superimposes itself into our relationship with God. He does because I did. No, no, he did so I can. And we have to be awakened to that because we have an enemy who 24-7 is trying to get our faith in other things other than just him. Nothing and no one is qualified to have your faith like God. So the enemy is always competing for that. That is the root of idolatry. The root of idolatry is trusting other things or other people more than we trust God. Amen. And it happens. <laughs> you know? So, but of course there's some better news here. Are we presenting our faith in him or our works to him? Is my faith in the rewarder or in my works being rewarded? Some people have more faith in their works getting rewarded than their faith in the rewarder. Yeah. For those that were here two weeks ago, do you remember that? <laughs> Need to hear it again? <laughs> yeah. This happens when we become faith-centric. Faith is important, but it's not central. You say by grace through faith. You're not saved by faith. Your faith can't save you. Only grace can save you through your little bit of faith. That little bit, you know. And so it's nice to know that it's, it's, he's the bigger part of the equation. It's really good news. Like I said, it does not diminish our part. But there's just, we don't have a chance without him. And we need to drink from that daily. We need to take a drink. We need to be reminded of that. I love what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. He says, man, I, what I am is by the grace of God. He says, I work more than all of these, but not me, the grace of God with me. So he's not diminishing what he's doing, but he's continually recognizing without the grace of God, this does not work. And of course, what's so encouraging about this contrast, because it's an incredible contrast, is the religious spirit or that poor performance proclivity does not win. Even though it's kind of a bummer to hear that we're all guilty as charged, we don't like that. We want to think, you know, we're batting a thousand, you know. We like to think, no, that would never happen to us. No, it happens to you. <laughs> we're all guilty as charged. But it doesn't win. We can see that. It doesn't have the final say. It reminds me of, of, of Matthew 28, 17. It was after the resurrection. They all saw him resurrected from the dead. They all saw him alive. And then they met him at a mountain that he specified. And then in verse 17, it says, they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubting. <laughs> But he didn't rebuke them for it. He didn't go, oh my goodness, we got to start over. These guys are useless. He didn't do that. Why? Because he was plugging them into his, his, his all authority, exousia. He was plugging them something, into something bigger than themselves, bigger than their faith, bigger than anything that they knew that they had. And it's the same for us. Folks, the contrast between the serious weaknesses we all have and the unconquerable nature of his authority and grace is stunning, that works in us is stunning. This is, this is one of the reasons why I love, let me see if I put this in here, something I'm just see if I wanna just double check something very quickly here. Okay, okay. All right, no, we're gonna continue, all right. Now, verse 6, verse 6 says this, is this not the fast that I choose? And remember when I shared this two weeks ago, 
You know, we're, we're so focused on the thing we're not eating, the snicker bars we said no to, you know, the meals we missed, whatever. We're so focused on what we're not doing we're, that we're missing. No, it's really, it's about what he's doing. It's about what he's done that we're supposed to lean into. Is this not the fast I choose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness? The undo the bands of the yoke? To let the oppressed go free? To destroy, to break every yoke. Think, break every yoke. That's, that's amazing. That's what we have in verse 6. And it's, it's in a question. It's framed in a question. Is it not the fast I choose? Now, sometimes questions are to, reveal, are to reveal ignorance. That's not this. This question is to awaken their memory. Because these were God's people. And they historically knew him as a God doing awesome stuff. Through imperfect people. In their history, they encountered God when they were slaves. They encountered God when they were pathetic, hopeless. It was impossible. And he wanted to awaken their memory to just the magnitude of what happens when, when he shows up. So that's, that's what this question is for. I mean, how many of you remember getting saved? getting born again. Raise your hand if you remember. Some of you do. Some of you may be okay. It just kind of happened. I get it. Some people have, it, you know, maybe over a period of time, but I had a radical salvation when I was at university 45 years ago. Rat and I remember it. And you know, I just remember the contrast between my utter hopeless helplessness and this incredible rescue. How will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? You know, just that, and we do need to do that. I mean, I love to drink from the well of that contrast. I do. I'm not saying I do it every day, but every week, at least a couple of times, I'm just remembering, wow, man, was I hopeless? Was I lost? You know, and then I just, wow. <laughs> and I remember the same is still true today. Nothing I've done, nothing I know, nothing I have makes me any more saved or any more powerful because of his goodness, because of his grace. It's the same truth. And so we, you need to, you know, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It didn't say you were kind of weak, a little sickly, you know, having a bad week. Bad day, you were dead. Dead. Dead, dead. Bad, dead. <laughs> Stinking, bad, dead. Physically dead's bad. But physically and spiritually dead, doubly bad. Man, wow, drink that in. You were dead. Deader than dead. Dead in your trespasses and sins. But God. <laughs> being rich in what? Mercy. God's got a better butt. <laughs> yeah. But God. You ought to drink that. Just, I get blasted when I drink on that one. Don't even sip. Just take a big guzzle. Yeah. Wow. We need to be, we need to be reminded of that. When my no turned to his yes, my life was radically changed. We're saying no to something. I'm not saying that you, there's something you do. Something happens. But you only can do that because of the mercy of God on your heart. You can't even repent. You can't even say no to that. If light hasn't turned on, if a revelation hasn't showed up with mercy and grace. So you can say no. So it all starts with him. It's never a work on our part. Ever. There's no work we can ever do to make that a reality in our life. So it starts with his goodness, and he awakens me, and that little mustard seed faith says, okay, I'll say no to that. I'm going to repent. I turn around, and kaboom! Yes, these big yeses from God that overtake my life. And anyway, so that's verse 6. But I want you to notice verse 7 is also a question. Do you guys have Bibles? Do, you know, Christians normally have that stuff. Well, but we want it on the overhead. Well, there it is. Okay, got it. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> for doing that. But verse 7, here's what's a, verse 7 is also a question where it says, is it not to divide your bread among the hungry? Is it not to bring the homeless poor into the house? Is it not to, when you see the naked, to cover him, to not hide yourself from your own flesh? It's, I want to submit this to you, that answering verse 6 is how verse, uh, answering verse 7 is how verse 6 gets activated. When you notice the language, it's like, Verse 6 and verse 7 are tied together. Verse 6, this is the nature of what his yes does. Verse 7 is specifically what his yes does to us. I love this. I'm, I, I want to take a bit of literary license. He does break every yoke. It says that. He breaks every yoke. Every false, counterfeit, control over your life, but he lets us in on it. He doesn't do it for us. He doesn't do it to us. He does it with us. That's what this is. There are some things he does to us. There are some things he does with us, but this is something that he's doing with us. It is the journey. It's our journey as the mature body of Christ. I've got some news for you. The body of Christ, yes, got some issues. Wherever you find people, you find issues. But there is a maturity. There is a Christ-like character that exists in the body today that has never existed on the planet, ever. Yeah. We are, we, we are really growing up. And, and, and we've gone through enough seasons to help us get there. How? Well, <laughs> I mean, we're getting pounded. And we just keep leaning into his yes. Things happen we have no control over. Challenges, difficulties, discomforts. We make mistakes. We mess up. Our spouse messes up. Whatever. And we just keep leaning into his left. We never allow ourselves to lean into the no. We never let the no. We just keep leaning into the yes. I mean, this is, this, let me read it. Let me, let me, this, is a, this is actually Ephesians 4. We are in Ephesians 4 in a way that the church has never been before. It says he's given some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, right? Until for the building up of the body of Christ, right? Until we attain to the unity of the faith. The unity of not our faith. The unity of faith. The unity of faith in what? Him. Not the unity of our faith. The unity of faith in Him. Till we all attain to that faith. Which is locked in Him. To a mature man. To the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. I mean, we, 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 we have some of that. We really do. A whole lot more than people realize. And the enemy loves to rub our nose in those, those wrinkles, you know, <laughs> those bad moments. And I'm not suggesting they're not there. But remember, our maturity isn't because suddenly we got our act together. Our maturity is that we just continue to say yes to him in spite of not having our act together. <laughs> it's a good word. Some of you aren't sure. <laughs> so anyway, this is what it means. Verse 6, which culminates in the breaking of every yoke, is in parallel to, is it not to divide your bread? with the hungry? Is it not to bring the homeless poor into the house? Is it to not, when you see the naked, to cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? This is where he broke, this is, you've got the vertical, he broke the yoke, he, the breaking of the yoke. It's been settled in heaven and now it's being applied on earth. And it happens in the context of our verse seven. This is us. And I wanna give you a little bit out of this. Divide your bread. 
Divide your bread with the hungry. Divide your bread with the hungry. Speaks of two things. It's really simple. It's not complicated. What you have that can bless another and Jesus, who is our bread of life. And it, does, it says your bread, what you have. Not what someone else has, but what's yours. The metric isn't in comparison to anybody else. Someone can give a thousand times more, but doesn't mean it's any better. Because it's your measure. It's what you have. That relationship with Jesus, you know. This giving is one of the best indicators of our origin, our design, and our maturity. This giving is one of the best indicators of origin. In other words, where we came from. Number two, design how we're made. Number three, maturity, where we are. The season, you know, that we are in. Giving is something that we can do no matter what we don't have. Do you know that? See, we often think giving is really based upon certain resources, certain amounts of material. And I'm not saying that those aren't valid, you know, variables in giving. But see, you know what a lot of Christians don't realize? It's not about the the stuff itself. The stuff that you give is merely packaging for what? Faith, hope, and love. Did you know that? Your giving isn't about the stuff. That's packaging for true riches, true spiritual life, faith, hope, and love. That's why you can give a lot under compulsion. It means little. God loves a cheerful giver. You know that scripture in Corinthians? And this is something that cannot be taken from you. Did you know that? Your capacity to give cannot be taken to you. And your capacity to give is essential, is central to the breaking of every yoke. And in this season like never before, I want to encourage you in that. What do you have? What do you have that can bless another? May not even be a material resource. It might just be a thank you, a smile, a hug. I mean, I, I was um, driving away from Willow Bridge, and, um, and there was a woman who was wanting to cross, do the crosswalk, and, and cars just, I saw was, I was about the fourth car, and they just kept going, and I stopped to let her go past. Folks, her face lit up with a smile that, man, I just knew she got such an endorphin injection. You know how much healthier she must have been after me stopping like that? I thought about it. I drove away and thought, man, she got some life. I mean, there, there's so many areas, but giving is a part, our giving. You know, we're the body of Christ. Did you know that? So when you give, it's the body giving faith, hope, and love. Yeah. It's the body of Christ giving faith, hope, and love, just like the body of Jesus did it when he walked the earth over 2,000 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He gave us that faith. He gave us that hope. He gave us that love. We got it all from him. I encourage you. And there's a lot of things we could say about giving. You know, we've never looked more like, we're never more like our heavenly father. All that, it's the best version of ourselves, all of that. But the bottom line is, it is, those the yokes are being broken. It's already been done. He's already decided. And now he's using our giving. It may be as, as simple as just a hug, just showing gratitude. It may be resource. It may be material. But every week, you need to go, okay, what can I give? And if you don't, let's just say for the sake of argument, you don't even have a, you don't, you know, you don't have any of that. Well, you got Jesus. 
You got Jesus. We all, that can never be taken from you. Divide that. What did Jesus do in your life? Share that with somebody. And see, please don't, this, we, we don't realize how impacting it is, how powerful faith, hope, and love is. And it's not being done just by a handful of people. It's, it's the ecclesia. It's the body. And it is just absolute. That's why the enemy's throwing his toys. Because the body of Christ is showing up with faith, hope, and love like never before. And faith, hope, and love often need a certain form. And it may be material. It may be just emotional, mental, you know, whatever. But it is a big priority. Look at your life and go, okay, what can I divide? What can I carve out? What can I be intentional about? Just be courteous when you drive. Some of you, you know, could use a little of that. You know? <laughs> I have to work on that. Ask my wife. I mean, I'm a very nice person, but when I drive, I like to go fast. You know, so. <laughs> so you know what? I think, quite frankly, my giving... When I'm courteous, when I drive, I think it's bigger for me than when you do it because it's easier for you because you drive slow. <laughs> but I'm driving fast, so I have to really rein it in to go, oh, go ahead. <laughs> That's why I think it was so much more powerful because it was a bigger sacrifice for me. <laughs> anyway, okay. Oh, we better get going here. I'm in trouble. B, we'll get through these quick. Bring the homeless poor into the house. Folks, this is talking about the poverty of community. Okay? Not talking about someone that doesn't have any money. It's the poverty of community, the homeless poor, without a home, without connections. They might have a place to live. You can live in a house and not have a home. All right? You, could have, you can have a wedding but don't have a marriage. Big difference between living in a house and living in a home, right? We know that's true. Providing connection and community, becoming a place of knowing and belonging. And folks, this is not a salvation issue. It's a kingdom advancing issue. So, you know, salvation's been settled. I mean, it's faith in Christ alone. But this is the kingdom advancing. All these yokes being broken. And yes, there's a different... You know, we all have different temperaments and different capacities that, that affect this process. But we all are designed to need it and to provide it. We have to quit making excuses for avoiding community or neglecting it. We got to quit it. Did you, know, <laughs> did you know that at least half of Jesus' disciples were introverts? Cave dwellers? People that just didn't want to, you know, did you know that? Did you know that more than half the world, less than half the world are extroverts? That's what studies show. You know what I'm saying? But, yet, you know, I don't think it doesn't matter to God. Community, relationships, connection is still a big deal. In fact, introversion isn't about, you know, disconnecting from people. It's a different um, um, a mental and emotional dynamic that people have by which they learn, they create, etc. But, but connecting with people, making eye contact, having conversation, not, you know, you can be in a, in a, in a group like this and still be without a home. You occupy space, but you're self-preserved. There's, you just, you know, you're, you, and you know the difference. You know when you're connecting. You know when you're being intentional to be known, you know, and this is such a priority in this day. You've heard us talk about it. Relationships have never been more powerful, but they've never been under more assault than they are today. Why? Because they are so powerful. Because, and it's not because of the organizational polish, but, polish, but because of the, the, the heart that has been so changed and so yielded uh, to, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The third one. And so getting relationships, community, you know, make it a priority. You know, just don't come to be in a room and sing some songs and, you know, and just kind of superficially meander about, but, you know, see some, see them. 
Often we don't see them. We just look right. You know what I'm saying? We don't see them. You know, eye contact. How are you? Can I pray for you? I got a word for you. Engaging community is so powerful. It is such a big deal. When you see the naked to cover them, that doesn't mean people are running around without clothes. Even though that could happen, we only have one example of it in the gospel record. So that's not what this is talking about. In this context, nakedness speaks of weakness, vulnerability, lack, need, and even sin. That's what this speaks of. To cover means to protect, to shield, to provide, to help, to restore. That's what it means to cover. So we are a safe place where people can be imperfect and not get shot. They can do boo-boos and not get rejected, right? <laughs> you know, if you have issues, which is likely because you're a human being, you don't have to hide. You know, that's what families are about. Well, we are a spiritual family. Culture of honor and the prophetic culture enables to see each other better than we are in the sense of a moment. You know, it does. That's just, that's what's so special about culture of honor and the and New Testament prophetic. You never just define people according to one moment, weakness, difficulty, bad season, poor behavior. We're all so much bigger and better than that. But equally true, being a covering is not a cover-up, okay? We don't ignore messes. A truly safe place is where messes can be made, and then messes are cleaned up by those who make their messes. <laughs> safe place. You can make a mess, but also you get to clean it up. Why? Because you're a powerful person. You're born again. you got Jesus in your life. It's not our job to clean up your mess. We believe you're a grown-up. We believe you have, because you have Jesus in your life and with the support of community, you can fix that. You can change that because that doesn't define you. That's what makes it. We don't have a safe community because there's no messes. We have a safe community because they can be made and they can be cleaned up and we can be better for it. It's such a big deal. And this is probably my favorite part of the revival kingdom culture. People say, no, it's the signs and the wonders and people falling down and laughing and miracles. That's amazing. But my, this is my favorite. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5 says, we no longer recognize anyone according to the flesh. Oh, man, when you see people the way Jesus sees people, there's nothing like it. It's like, wow, I see what. And I get it now. That's why you came to die for Denver. Wow, what a dude. You know. It's my favorite part of revival kingdom culture is being able to see one another like Jesus does. It's, one, it's so, such freedom. And then finally, the last one, do not hide yourself from your own flesh. <laughs> it, doesn't matter. it doesn't matter how much you know. It doesn't matter how much you've done. It doesn't matter how many victories you have accumulated. You still can act like a knucklehead. Yeah. How do I know? I know. Because <laughs> I'm one. You know, we, we can still be lead actors in Dumb and Dumber. Every one of you. <laughs> and you know, the worst culprits are usually those who have been Christians the longest and who have accomplished the most. Before God, we are novices in daily need of his mercy and grace, which comes from him through people. It doesn't matter how many victories we have. And if you don't live this way, you are set up to going down. And we know that. We got a lot of church history that shows. Wow, look at them. Wow, look at her. You know? Um, we are novices in need of his mercy and grace from him and through people. Now, yes, when I'm operating in an area of responsibility, 
with specific grace, authority, anointing, then I'm going to be pretty decisive. I'm not going to second guess. No one's going to push me around. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm not suggesting that we're all just sort of, you know, I'm not talking about that. But, but before God, man, I, you know, man, I need his grace. I need his mercy. And he can bring it through whoever he wants. And I better be willing and ready to have him bring that. Be ready. And the, how, how the mighty can fall. You know, I be, it's better to just humble yourself with childlike faith. Trust me. It just is a whole lot better. There's no safer space. You are not safe if you just sit there and polish your trophies. You need to throw them to God as quick as possible. We got trophies, got medals, we got shiny stuff. Just give it quickly to God. Lest they talk to you and convince you of things that just, mm, <laughs> that's not true. You know? And of course, one of my favorite illustrations, I'm gonna close with this, and it's the log and the speck. It's in Matthew, well, it's in two places. Matthew chapter seven is my favorite. And this is what he says. He says, how are you trying to take the speck out of your, how are you trying to take the speck out of your brother's life eye when you don't see the log in your own eye? First take the spe log out of your eye, then you can help your brother take the speck out of his. And when I used to read that years ago, I thought, man, that's, it's, it's, man, logs, what the, wow. And then I had, I had an experience that I realized it's, it really is, it, it, there's, the difference is in mass. It's not like they don't have big issues in their life. But in light of my destiny, what's in my life is more of a log than what's in their life. You know what I'm saying? In light of what affects me, What's in their life is minuscule. It's like a speck compared to what's in my life. And I was, I was up in Johannesburg. We, stayed, we lived in Johannesburg about 18 years. And I was driving on Louis Butt Avenue through or at the bottom of Orange Grove. And I don't know if anybody knows, remembers Louis Butt Avenue and it going over to Empire Road to go to the campus. And it, the robots, every block is a robot. And they were not synchronized. They were awful. And I remember driving and, and I was waiting at the robot to turn green and all of a sudden this white BMW goes flying past me. And I knew exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to get to the next robot before it became red because they weren't synchronized. And I must confess, when they did that, I was slightly irritated. Because you know, I was in front, you know, and when you, you, you kind of, you know, I should be ahead, you know, and they just flew by me and I was just slightly, just slightly irritated and they didn't make it. And I knew they wouldn't, they didn't make it and they were stopped at the next robot. So I get up side to side. It's a woman. I couldn't believe it. I thought for sure it's a wild young dude, you know, it's a lady. And I mean, as soon as that robot turns green, she just floors it, man spins the wheels, takes off, because she's trying to do the same thing. Now I'm offended. <laughs> I'm offended, and I'm literally, I promise you, I'm looking for a traffic officer. I'm just hoping, praying, that a traffic officer sees this, this vixen, a vehicle mayhem, you know. I mean, I really, and, and I really, I literally was praying and looking for a traffic officer because that distance was about three kilometers and then it goes around. Then we go around this, 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 uh, this L shape and we come to the robot where there's, you turn right to on Empire Road and there's two, there's two turning lanes. I'm in one, she's in one. And I look in my rearview mirror and there's a police officer. Oh, Jesus loves me. I mean, I'm thinking, yeah. And I'm just praying she doesn't notice. I don't want her to notice. Because I want her to do her stuff. I want her to be crazy. I, I really, that was it. I hope she does something really illegal. And, and, and you know, when suddenly the light was green, there were no turning arrows there. So the right away was the oncoming traffic. She floors it and she goes right through. And I'm thinking, whoo, is she in trouble? Because she didn't have right away. She floored it. And then after the traffic passed, I turned. And I hear the siren. 
And I'm going, yeah, get her, man. And <laughs> get her, you know. And I don't see him passing me. And I look in my rearview mirror, and he's pulling me over. <laughs> yeah, pulling me over. I couldn't believe it. I'm in utter disbelief. The crazy lady's taking off. And I, ro I rolled down my window thinking, what is, what is this? Comes up to me, says, you didn't indicate. <laughs> the lady's killing people. <laughs> driving like a flipping maniac, and I didn't indicate. <laughs> I didn't put my indicator on. Boy, after he gave me my ticket. He still gave me a ticket. I tried to use my accent, you know, being an American. You know, oh, really? Oh, okay. Gave me a ticket. Boy, and right after, I, I, right after he left, I, I heard God. <laughs> Son, it'll never be the big thing in someone else's life that takes you off the road of your destiny, but the little thing you don't deal with in your own. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's what, and you know, when you have a revelation of his grace and his goodness, so you don't have to be afraid have to hide from him and then you're in a community of people where there's it's not based on your best behavior it's based on his best behavior showing up through your faith you can do that and that's the connection that's what we're that's this is how we get to live and here's the thing when we do living this way causes yokes to be broken all the yokes I mean, we often think of yokes being broken because of the laying out of hands. And don't get me wrong, I believe in the laying out of hands. But I think the gifts are merely for activating a body, a whole body that's doing it everywhere. And to the degree that they will let the, the character of Christ operate in their life to this extent is to the degree that yokes are being broken. Salvation is happening. You talk about harvest, Johan. We are in unprecedented territory and we all get to be a part of it. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Here's the bottom line. Where's our faith? Is it in our faith? Is it in our culture, our job, our education, our wit, our wisdom? Is it in everything other than Jesus? Then we are religious at best. We are bound. And we are just, we're, we're, we're just disasters waiting to happen. Faith in Christ alone. We say no in one direction and we lean right into his yes. If anybody's in here and you are at best religious, may have the best of intentions. We all do. It doesn't matter. Where is our faith? Where is our trust? Is it in our parents' relationship with God? Is it our, in our own understanding of what it means to be a Christian? All that stuff. Is it because we just do what the Bible says? No. no. It's in Jesus. We put our faith and trust in Him as Lord and Savior. We put our faith and trust in His goodness that lives through us, His faithfulness that lives through us, His kindness that lives through us, His provision that lives through us every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in here and you're, you don't have that kind of relationship with Jesus or you're online and you don't have that kind of relationship with Jesus, that's the only one. It's the only kind he came to give you. He came to give you himself fully and completely and he lives through your life fully and completely. It's so wonderful. It's so amazing and it's just a little no in one direction and a yes and a turn towards his yes. Repent. No to that and leaning into the yes. You're his son. You're
his daughter. You're forgiven, you're delivered, you're healed, you're his. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here and you're not right with Jesus and you want to be, would you raise your hand if that's you? Would you raise your hand if that's you? Anybody in here need to do that? Anybody need to do that? Online, if you're raising your hand, I can't see you. (laughs) But he does. He does. Wow. Thank you, Father, for this incredible season we have. On the one side, we see our weaknesses, we see our shortcomings, we see our mistakes. We're not supposed to hide ourselves from our own flesh. But wow, look at what happens. Not I, but the grace of God in me. Not I, but his goodness through me. If you feel like there's an area of your life and you've been trusting, this isn't a salvation issue now, it's just... There's an area of your life and you're trusting everything else but Jesus. You know, that thing is just, you know, wow, it is a place of continuous oppression, fear, anxiety, worry, striving, tension, fighting. That's because the wrong, the, the wrong authority is in charge. Something other than Jesus is in charge. And if you know what that area is and you want to be included in this prayer, would you raise your hand? Just raise your hand if that's you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know what that is. Okay, good. Father, right now for those that the hand raising is just a symbol. It's just a representation of, of light shining, of illumination, just partnering with them right now, leaning into them to bring them closer to you, to bring their faith out of the the margins, out of these other places, these sticky places, places that are kind of sticky, their faith kind of gets stuck there, to loose it right now, to loosen the bond of wickedness, undo the band of the yoke. Let the oppressed go free. Break the yoke now. Father, in Jesus' name, Jesus' name, freedom. Just freedom. Wow. Wow. And Jesus is central. Everything else lines up right now. Just pray for that. Father, I thank you for salvation, deliverance, healing. I thank you that your kingdom is coming like never before through all of us. Thank you for the season we're in. Thank you for Isaiah 58 coming alive. Thank you for the repairing, the rebuilding, the restoring. That you you literally have called us to, to, to soar on the heights of the earth. It has that in there as well. Father, thank you for the soaring. Thank you for the illumination. Thank you for these incredible breakthroughs that aren't prophetic words coming the years to come, but they are right now. These incredible breakthroughs, financial, relational, emotional, mental, physical, educational, governmental, Father, for South Africa, revival, reformation, restoration. We're signed up for it. Harvest of souls, people that know you, encounter you, hear you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, could I have the, could I have our love team come up? Our ministry team, just to come up here? This has been really good. I think. <laughs> Tell you that worship, wow. <laughs> you start drinking like there, it's hard to do about anything else. Fantastic. If you need prayer, God does so much. I mean, I can be saying one thing and the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on a lot of other things. You know that. So if there's other things going on you need prayer for, whatever it is, we're here to pray with you, to pray for you. And uh, yeah, wonderful. Great being here. Great being together. Next week you get another. Don't miss next week. Do not. Jesus is going to be here. Love you guys. Have a great Sunday. You're the best. Thank you.